Northeast Regional Tour, we would be remiss if we didn't visit the tall grass prairie. We are just north of Pawhuska, Oklahoma, and joining me today is Bob Hamilton, who is the director of the tall grass prairie. Bob, it's beautiful out here, even in the end of July. Thank even you. Even when it's toasty, yeah. 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 So tell us a little bit for somebody who maybe has not been here before. What is this place all about? Well, welcome. Thank Glad you. Glad to hear, Casey. Yeah. Uh, the Tallgrass Prairie, I think, is one of those iconic North American landscapes. So, uh, unfortunately, it's one of the most highly, or the most highly converted landscape that we have in North America. So, the estimates are only about 4% of the original Tallgrass Prairie remains. So, 96% or so has been converted. So, primarily to cropland. So, this is the eastern part of the Great Plains of North America. Some of the most fertile soils, good rainfall. So much of it's been converted to corn, soybeans, wheat. And it used to stretch up to Nebraska and, and further? It used to be, yeah, roughly, uh, <clears throat> yeah, roughly about 140 million acres from Texas up to southern Canada. So kind of that whole eastern part of the Great Plains. So. All right. And so here you have bison roaming around. We have some way off in the distance. We do. They we do. In the distance yeah. over here. Yeah. Um, and, and they're an important part of this, but you're you're kind of stewarding this and getting it back to how it used to be managed by mm -hmm. the bison and the fire. Tell us a little bit about mm -hmm. that. Well, the, the mission of the Nature Conservancy, the organization, the nonprofit group that owns and manages the preserve, is to conserve all life and, and basically it comes down to habitat protection. Mm -hmm. And so in these Great Plains grasslands, what we think is, is extremely important in terms of providing habitat for all those species is a heterogeneous or a diverse landscape. Different species require different types of habitat. And so the idea is, is to create and maintain this shifting landscape patch mosaic. At any given moment in time, you have patches on the landscape that have been fairly recently disturbed in terms of natural disturbance, grazing and fire, and then other patches on the landscape that have been years since that. And so there's different species that require all those different niches. And so it's it's kind of like building and maintaining a living ark. And when you say species, we're not talking about just plant species. We're talking about animal species and insect species. All of those come into play. All that good biodiversity. Yeah, yep. yeah. Yep. So, um, and you know, when I first saw prescribed burning happening, I was like, you missed a spot, but that's, <laughs> that's okay, you know? It, it, yeah. Because it goes where the fuel is. Right. Um, and then you, that's that patchwork effect that it creates. Yeah, and then the bison, <clears throat> of course, Grazing and fire, we think, were, were one of the supreme influences historically on these Great Plains grasslands. Burn it and they will come. It, it's a global phenomenon with herbivores that it's all about forage quality. That lush regrowth that comes up after a fire, wow, that's just ice cream. But we do know historically, of course, uh, bison were the, were the primary grazer historically in these Great Plains grasslands. And oh my goodness, boy, you burn a patch and they are on it. It's just like you know, candy out there on the landscape. So, and, and while this is one of the, if not the largest preserve of this um, ecosystem, I mean, it's fairly small compared to what it used to be, right. but how large is your preserve here? We have about 40,000 acres that we manage. And in addition to that, we have conservation easements and, and other land protection tools that we put out there on about another 11,000 acres around us. Okay, so tell us a little bit about the, the bison. Obviously, that's an interest for a lot of people. Um, you know, how do you manage that? Are they just roam around free? Or they just kind of do their thing. Or... Yeah, yeah, you know, as long as they don't sneak up on <laughs> yeah. that, we're okay. Um, <clears throat> we try to manage bison to really manage for their wildness, mm -hmm. for still their inherent strengths. Um, this is one of 12 bison herds that the Nature Conservancy owns and manages. We put bison back into these native prairies kind of in a, an attempt to put the ecological humpty back together. Okay. So yeah, we put bison back here. We introduced our starter herd in the fall of 93. Took about 15 years to build up to the stable herd size that we have. So now we're capped at about, well, typically we overwinter about 16 or 1700 bison, and we'll have six to 700 babies in the springtime. So what's then managing an ecosystem? You always have a wolf, right? Or something that kind of... Yeah, yeah. So who's managing the yeah, bison? Yeah, there are limits in all systems, yeah. right? And so, yeah, we are the wolf, okay. as I think of it. Uh, part of our restoration attempt, so I, I think of our a lot of our work out here is process restoration. Let's get the prairie functioning as it used to, historically, that grazing fire interaction. Of course, predators would have been a big part of that system, historically. We have no plans to reintroduce wolves. Uh, the, the wolf would have been the primary historic uh, 
a predator on bison. That's just an impractical idea in a privately owned landscape. What's all around us is privately owned ranches. And so we just, we just can't really go there. And so we are the wolf, as I think of it. So we try to round the entire bison herd up in the fall, usually late October, early November. Uh, two primary reasons. One is health maintenance. Uh, we want to make sure that the bison are healthy. We want, really want to make sure also that, that we don't have a disease situation that could impact our rancher neighbors. Right. You keep mentioning restoration of the prairie. So are there like objectives or is, and I know a garden's never done, <laughs> not that this is a garden, but a landscape is ever evolving. But is this prairie restored or what are some of those other benchmarks that you're trying to achieve? It's restored in terms of kind of that process mm -hmm. level restoration, mm -hmm. that grazing fire. Uh, all the research that we've we've had going on indicates that that's working pretty well to, to meet our objectives of, of the conservation of biological diversity. Mm -hmm. It's working real well for plant and animal conservation. But you're never really done. And so as, as many uh, landowners and conservation agencies and others are dealing with, invasive species are a common problem. And, and we sure have our, our little uh, challenges out here. Uh, Cerecia lespediza is probably our biggest non-woody invasive plant problem. That's a plant that was introduced on purpose over 100 years ago from Southeast Asia. And so it's crept out into these native prairies. What makes it so successful is it builds up tannins in its tissues. And so it, it causes a, an imbalance uh, in a grazing animal's stomach. Oh. So it's kind of a chemical defense sort of. So they don't want to eat it. So that's a tough one. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And, and the other big issue, of course, as, as we're seeing globally, is, is increase of woody species in these native grasslands. Mm -hmm. And that's happening around the world, and there's a lot of discussion on what's really driving that. Um, but we know a lot of it is from altered fire regime. So the way uh, with settlement, how we've altered that fire pattern on the landscape has allowed things like eastern red cedar, which is a native species, right, right. to creep out into the prairie. And uh, the green glacier is, is something that's been talked about from our friends with, at Oklahoma State University, from some of their publications. But those juniper species from Texas, Oklahoma, up through the Great Plains, it's a problem now up in Nebraska even. Okay. And so again, that's, that's from altered fire regime. Those eastern red cedars are fairly easily controlled by fire until they get to be big. And then, then uh, in terms of fire management, they become a problem because they're so explosive. And then also in terms of woody stuff, uh, one thing we are actively trying to push on now in the last few years is kind of creeping brush invasion. So some of these clonal species that we have out here, like dogwood, uh, rough-leaf dogwood, and sumac, and some of the plum species, mm -hmm. started as an individual, and after 20, 30 years, you have a 50-foot diameter mott, okay. or an island, and then trees start growing up through the middle of that. And so it changes, it changes the prairie from the prairie to, to more of a, a woodland type system. And we know species like prairie chickens, uh -huh. uh, the greater prairie chicken that we have here, they, they are very sensitive and intolerant of any vertical fragmentation, whether you're talking as eastern red cedar tree, a hackberry tree, uh, a wind tower, anything vertical like that. They, their hard wiring through the eons has been to avoid those. Anything tall. Okay. Yeah, especially hens when they're nesting. This is sort of a laboratory, right? It because is. it is one it of is. the only places where you can step back into time mm -hmm. and see these processes. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about the research that's come off of that, obviously with the prairie chickens and other things as well. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're about a little over 200 scientific publications that have been produced from the preserve. Uh, the Nature Conservancy is not a research institution ourselves. We're science driven. Mm -hmm. Science influences where we, you know, guides us what, what lands are important, what species are important, our strategies, and how we're monitoring our success, our land management, you know, science informs all that. Um, but we are not a, a research institution, but we reach out to and try to form partnerships, especially with folks like Oklahoma State University, that uh, especially when it comes to trying to engage in the conservation issues of the broader neighborhood, who better to work with than, than the extension experts right. out there? Well, obviously, there's so much to see here. Where can a visitor find more information about the Tallgrass Prairie? I'd suggest going on the website, so tnc.org, and you can drill down to the Tallgrass Prairie Preserve and see all kinds of information. Um, the preserve is open to the public every day of the year. The, there's about 20 miles of public roads, gravel, <laughs> <laughs> be forewarned, uh, county gravel roads that run through the preserve, most of that being in the bison unit. So it's an open range situation. 
you, you break them, you buy them. So don't bump into any bison. Uh, <laughs> but it's it's quite variable today. You know, the, the bison are kind of off the county road. But some days we have those Yellowstone type experiences where They're you right. be you become the pebble in the stream and the bison flow around your vehicles and they lick your mirrors and rub on your car. And but don't get out. Yes. So you know, kind of respect their wildness. But but yeah, the preserve is open every day of the year at headquarters at the, the old Chapman Barnard Ranch headquarters. We have a visitor center that's run by docent volunteers. They're trained to, to talk to people about what the Nature Conservancy is doing, um, the Native American history, cattle ranching history, oil and gas, you know, kind of whatever, whatever you want to hear about. Um, and we have a set of self-guided hiking trails right there near headquarters up to about three miles. Scenic turnouts along the way on the county road. So it's kind of a uh, self-guided type experience. Yeah. Um, you know, no theme parks, no water slides, <laughs> but I think of the prairie as this very subtle landscape. And I think what makes it interesting is learning how it works and learning who's here in terms of the native plants and animals. Well, it's absolutely beautiful. And thank you so much for sharing it with thank us, Bob. Thank you, appreciate you coming out. We hope you enjoyed this video as part of our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. You can also find even more videos on the OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel. And join us on social media for great gardening tips, photos, and discussion.